Are we going to see 100% loan-to-value mortgages here in Canada? Well, that's what we talk about with our good friend, broker owner, Roland Kim, all the way from Vancouver, right after this. Okay, my friends, here we are. And as promised, yes, that's our, our favorite mortgage, mortgage broker. Uh-uh, our yeah. favorite realtor uh, all the way yeah, from Vancouver. I got mortgage broker on the mind here. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and the financing and everything else that's coming into our Canadian market. And there's always seems to be something to talk about. And of course, in the Vancouver market, uh, just as it is here in my Toronto market, we're seeing strong, strong sales. And you're seeing that too, Roland. Yeah, we're definitely over the last four weeks. It's been interesting um, just week over week seeing it kind of build. Um, but within kind of the existing buyer base and the realtor community, so a lot of the peripheral um, community isn't aware yet how busy it is. You know, it's not an item in the news yet. But, um, you know, when I look at the stats year over or not even year over year, but year to date so far, the prices in Vancouver have recovered nearly 10%. And um, we're only about 5% off now from our all-time high last April, right? And when you think in January, we're down about 15% from April. So we're catching up and volume is continues to grow. I think right now we're selling about 126 homes, units a day in Vancouver Marketplace. And when you track that out through the month of May, it's going to make this May the second busiest in the past six years. And the yeah. public doesn't yeah. even know about it yet. So I really think, you know, I think uh, the prices are going to get squeezed a little bit in the months ahead as as it becomes more popular or more commonplace to talk about how busy the market is again. And um, what's interesting is like our listings aren't the reason, aren't making up for it. I mean, our listings are literally 25% lower now than they were pre-pandemic. What's, what's starting to happen is listings that previously sat on the market for quite a while are being bought because you know the buyers are starting to figure out like what other options are out there than competing in multiples for you know the, the hot stuff and um, it's interesting to watch it kind of build and see where we are by fall but I think I think there's a real chance we may retake our all-time high prices from last April is that right and I know at the very beginning of May we had about a few four or five days into May and you said even then, uh, it was already tracking to be one of the best Mays ever. And it's still tracking like that from what I understand. Yes. Yeah. It's increased a little bit. We were like, I think 124 units a day, you know, seven days into the month. Now we're 126 units a day. So it seems exactly. to be building. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And is, is there any segment or product in the market, condo detached towns, otherwise that is just, I don't know if it's flying under the radar is the right, the right term here, but just something that maybe there's just still a slight opportunity from a buyer's perspective. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen the, the not that the foreclosure market's a big market in our, in our marketplace, but certainly I'm not seeing foreclosures get competitive yet. So the foreclosure market, um, kind of like that, um, exactly what you mentioned, it's, it's the market that flies under the radar. So the loft market, you know, a lot of um, that hasn't gotten busy yet. The loft market is is relatively slow. And I know the market is really heated when the lofts start getting busy, because what that tells me is folks who are looking for one bedroom uh, properties, you know, are asking the realtors, what else is out there, you know, and then eventually they come up with, well, there's this thing called a loft where you get more square footage than in one bedroom, but you don't have a bedroom. And the other version of that is kind of the two bedroom townhouses. We don't have a lot of them, but they're quite dormant. Right now we have two listed and, and it's like our only two properties we haven't sold so far this year. And, um, you know, there's probably quite a few people that are looking at three bedroom townhouses, but really can be sufficient and comfortable in two because it's almost the same size. It's just missing a bedroom. But the fact that that market isn't busy yet is also telling me, you know, the pressure is certainly not at a boiling point where the buyer is getting creative. Interesting. So from a buyer's perspective, and and typically are those first time home buyers that are buying into the, say, the two bedroom condo or or the loft, is, is that typically the buyer avatar type thing? Uh, not really, because it's, okay. um, I'd say it's almost more um, people who are looking for, you know, for like, the, for example, in the townhouse market, it's, it's folks who 
see the future, they may need more square footage. And so they're looking, you know, to buy a three bedroom instead of a two bedroom uh, apartment because, or because, um, you know, they don't want to have to move again when they have one or two kids, but they don't currently need all that space. And so some of them, you know, look at the, the, the walk up two bedroom townhouse and they'll say, you know, that totally sufficient for the next five years. And, and, you know, it's, it's 15% less than one with an extra bedroom and 200 square feet, 100 square feet larger. Um, so it's kind of, uh, I think there's lots of people that should be buying our two bedroom townhouses. They just don't know they exist because on, on our system, you no one searches for a two bedroom townhouse. It's like searching for a two bedroom house, right? Yeah, like it's yeah. minimum three bedrooms. Yeah, exactly. And and that would be the same here. I mean, typically any two bedroom is, is what we'd call the bungalow here. Uh, and, and usually that is the, you know, the retiree moving into that, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, for sure. So and I don't know how close you follow that foreclosure of power of sale market. And I know here in, in Ontario, you know, everyone talks about, well, the high, raising interest rates and, and everything else and, and the pressure that's being put on that and, and people not being able to keep up with, say, their variable, uh, variable rate uh, payments and everything. I do kind of keep track on who's or who the power of sale uh, is, meaning is it uh, an A lender bank or is it a B lender or a C lender? And I can tell you from Ontario's perspective, at least the Golden Horseshoe, it's all those secondary, like B lenders and C lenders or private lenders that are going power of sale. Would that be similar uh, in, in the Vancouver case? I'd say it's a little bit different. I don't even okay. attribute it to a lack of equity. I, I attribute most of foreclosures to emotions. And what I mean by that is um, probably involved in, you know, two, two, three uh, foreclosures a year, probably list one or two and then buy maybe one or two. And every single foreclosure that I have listed and sold, in the end, the court has handed a check back to the person that's gone into foreclosure. So mm -hmm. what that means is like there's tons of equity in almost every foreclosure that I've been part of, but emotional roadblocks have come up and the right and the process has broken down. So often it's in my experience, it's divorces where one person um, walks away or, or one person's, you know, supposed to take care of the, the house and they stop and they get so frustrated that they don't, you know, take a, a pause and list the home themselves and move forward with their life. They kind of just dig their heels in and, and avoid it. And so, so many of the foreclosures that I have worked on, um, you know, the house has hundreds of thousands or the, the condo hundreds of thousands of dollars of free equity, but they're not, they've kind of like given up. And so my experience with foreclosures in Vancouver is very little tied to um, running out of proceeds. And obviously there's a few, but it tends to be like our marketplace. I don't know if you know this, but in Vancouver, 50% of houses, like all property class doesn't even have a mortgage on it. Like there's so much money there. Yeah. And so in Canada, especially I'd say, you know, the, and I don't know this offhand, but I'm guessing it's probably the average if you average it out with the folks that have no mortgage and the ones that do, I'd say the average person probably has at least 35% equity. Right. So even, like you really have to run out of money and have a lot of roadblocks in your way for a long time to get to a place where you couldn't remove yourself from your home through a sale and still walk away with equity. That's so right. in my experience, it's more poor decision making and, um, you know, emotional breakdown that leads to the foreclosures. Yeah. Interesting. You, yeah. You are right though, that many of them are activated by like second and third lenders because they're frustrated that they're the first people typically that get you know the payment stops yeah but it's like it's amazing they all tend to have equity in the home and they could solve the problem if they wanted to but they just kind of throw their hands up yeah yeah and and people often think too and i know it would be the same in your market uh power sale or foreclosure well there's going to be a deal uh, yeah. you there's really not it, they sell for fair market value 99.9 .9 percent of the time right yeah. uh I've yeah, been, and the opposite too, right? I'm sure you've seen where back in the day pre-COVID where we used to go to court and there'd be an accepted offer. Everyone knows the price. And then, you know, p competing folks would come in. Typically, the person who has the accepted offer, in my experience, often loses in the end because they already feel they have it for a specific price. So maybe they add another five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 on it. And they're like, hey, I'm paying, you know, $10,000 more than, than what I have it accepted for. 
And a third party can come in and be like, well, you know, you have it accepted at 500. I think it's worth 600. So I'll pay, you know, 585. And they outmaneuver the original offer. And then I've seen it where like, you know, people get excited and they're in, they're in foreclosure court and they, they want the property. And so it's like, what's the price, you know, that will take it. And they make a price. Literally, I've seen this where they, they offer a price that's higher than the equivalent unit that, that's on the market in the building, not in foreclosure with all, all the liability. And you're like, you know, it's human nature is a funny thing. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So off air, we were talking a little bit about some of the the international pressures, if you will, like what's going on in the States and their economy. And, and even uh, with with the new mortgage announcements or financing announcements in the UK, uh, share, share some thoughts there, because I know it. everyone thinks, well, what does that have to do with my home in the middle of Burnaby or wherever it is? No, it has actually has a lot to do with it, doesn't it? It definitely does. Like we're, we're, you know, we're the little sister, little brother to the U S um, and yet as we, as we are getting, you know, longer in the tooth as Canada, I am noting, noticing more and more separation. It's not a direct correlation anymore, you know, um, equally measured. What I mean by that is I believe that, um, Vancouver and BC and I think many parts of Canada are you know going to go back to all-time highs over the next 12 months I actually think the next 18 months are going to be extremely busy and um, I don't see that in the states like I actually am seeing a little bit of a decoupling where in the US I mean there is a lot of of markets on the east coast and such that prices are, are pulling back substantially and haven't recovered um, there's a lot of migration kind of into the core of, of the U.S. where it seems to be a bit stronger and the Pacific tends to be a bit stronger. But, you know, the U.S., I'm noticing they're having, a, you know, real job losses that are starting to add up. They're, um, you know, they're dealing with a debt ceiling that they're going to approve and push through again. But they have um, a lot more, I think, bankruptcies and negative things on the horizon in their, in their business economy that will affect their housing. Um, our housing is, I think, a lot more stable and there's a lot more pressure on it. And so for, I think for the first time in the couple of years ahead, we'll notice that we are operating differently than the states. You know, yeah. we used to kind of trend them a lot more. And where I see that is one of the few markets where I find in, in BC that's slow right now is Whistler. And, you know, it's it's two hours away from Vancouver. And it used to be a direct correlation to Vancouver where um, successful folks in Vancouver would, you know, pay off their home or buy a home and then eventually maybe buy a, a vacation property in Whistler. And so when Vancouver did well, Whistler did well. But since Vail bought Whistler and, and Whistler in, in many ways is more tied now to the American economy. And so, you know, the prices have gone up so much in Whistler over COVID and over the last many years that I'm noticing the prices are coming down now there because of the American economy, even though the Vancouver economy is very strong because there's less and less Vancouver people buying in Whistler. Very interesting. That is interesting. And and then with, with the... Uh, new new additional financing option they have in the UK that provides some unique, I don't know, is trendiness a word? And <laughs> what what could happen to our economy here, or or the perception of it with one hundred percent loan to value and everything else? Yeah, there's you're starting to see a few things that you know I think were pre prevalent before two thousand and nine happened, and so it does make you wonder: are we are we pushing too much leverage back into the marketplace? And certain you know certain European countries have like generational mortgages, have negative mortgage rates, right? Like it's there's um, you know Canada's real estate is the enemy of the world. Like it's one of the most stable well-structured, you know, to that point, I've been a realtor for 15 years. I would say my first time buyers today are much more qualified than first time buyers 15 years ago. I remember when I stumbled into real estate, you know, um, some of my previous clients from food and beverage and facility management, I'm like, let's go find you an apartment. They're like, I'm never going to qualify for apartment. And I'm like, well, let's see. And they, back then they even got, uh, like uh, zero percent mortgages, yeah. you know, where RBC gave them the 5% and, and raised the interest a little bit over the next five years. So they got paid back and they had a 40 year amortization. Now, many of those folks are living in $2 million houses right now. And they couldn't have, like in today's market, I'm dealing with first time buyers that have saved up, you know, 20% on a $600,000 condo and they're making 80,000 to 120,000. 
And, you know, like they are way more established and stronger candidates. And yet we've made it much harder for them. So that's on right. one hand, that's sad because I think we're really undermining their opportunity in the next generation. On the flip side, that offers so much stability to our marketplace that we we don't really fluctuate. You know, when you think of the high of the market from last April to the low, I'd say, you know, this December, it was like a 15 percent swing and and um, barely, you know, that's from an all time high to like a little bit pulled back. And now we're building again and um, we're just a very stable, you know, well entrenched marketplace. Yeah, you do bring up a good point, though, when when the valuations weren't as high as they are right now and say 15, 20 years ago, when when even 20 years ago, when I bought my first house, uh, similar to perhaps your clients. Yeah, we got a, a cashback mortgage. We borrowed some of our RSP and we actually had zero of our own actual hard earned savings, apart from some RSP funds, go yeah. into the transaction. Right. And when values aren't as high, uh, banks can get a little bit more creative with that. But I, I have a sneaky suspicion, though, that over the next several months, banks will provide some unique opportunities to 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 loan to to borrow their money, as it were, right? And and yeah, they're still you know they're still they're still very conservative, and they will be, right? Yeah. But I I think I my gut feeling is we'll see that open up just ever so slightly with. Uh, whatever that looks like. I'm sure they're, they're creative when they need to be. Yeah. I mean, I guess they can be less creative now that inflation didn't go down again. Right. That's a yeah. real hurdle of um, it'll be interesting to see on June 7th, what the bank of Canada does on the next meeting for the overnight rate. That's but, right. Um, yeah. It's pretty crazy that uh, inflation didn't go down. It went up a little bit. And so we're, I think we're trending definitely for no rate cuts this year and maybe even another rate increase or two in the next couple months. Well, if you're, if you like me and you enjoy Twitter on, on an educational level, but also at an entertainment level, that's what all the, the, you know, basement economists are saying, right. With, and, and there's, and there's some great mortgage brokers and other economists and, and, uh, um, reporters out there that follow the market, uh, and, and that's what they're saying too, right. Just because of that inflation announcement uh, the other day. Uh, it does lead to, yeah, perhaps we need another slight rate in uh, hike, and and who knows where that's going to end up. But all we know is real estate, and I know you look at it like this, best observed over the long term. Yes, we buy and sell in the market that we're currently in, but that yes. long-term perspective is always the best way to look at it, my friend. How do people get a hold of you? Really easy. Find me online, Roland Kim or the Kim Buna team. Google my name and, and you can get hold of me many ways. There you have it. So that's Roland Kim all the way from Vancouver. And I'm Gary McGowan. We'll see everybody on the next video. Bye for now. Thanks, Gary.